This morning we're launching a new series. We spent all of January talking about conversations with God, conversations with God. We're going to spend February uh, talking about conversations about God, conversations about God. We're going to look at a passage this morning from Romans chapter 5, and it says, you see, at just the right time, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Uh, how do you have a conversation about God? Honestly, a lot of people would prefer to avoid conversations like this. Sometimes we just feel inadequate. I'm by no means an expert, we think, to be able to talk about God. And sometimes we feel like we're going to get something wrong or leave something out. One of my favorite things to do with pastors when we get together is I will tell a story about something I said from the front of the room that was horribly embarrassing. And then we all take turns. And I am telling you, there has been unbelievable things said from the front of the room. <laughs> and so we're just afraid we'll get something wrong or leave something out. And this is actually where we make a really big mistake because most of us believe that what we're supposed to make is a presentation about God rather than a conversation about God. And those are two very different things. If you were going to talk to someone about your best friend... You wouldn't try to go through every detail of the information and history you have with them. You would actually connect something in the conversation you're having with them with something you know about someone that you love. So you wouldn't tell everything. And you would assume that there will be other conversations. So it would be kind of connected. There would be more to tell and more opportunities to tell it. And when it comes to conversations about God, I have to tell you that God is seriously misunderstood in our world. In fact, without a doubt, the most seriously misunderstood uh, being in all of the universe. Nearly everyone has an opinion about God. You've probably noticed. And it's often based on something they're afraid of or something that they hope is true. And I've heard lots of opinions about God. The question is, what's the evidence for those opinions? Our fears and our hopes are not quite the same as evidence. And then there's been teaching and preaching about God. I heard one pastor say it this way. He said, uh, the Bible must be God's word because it's withstood 2,000 years of bad preaching and it's still around. <laughs> and that's probably true. I've listened to some of my own messages and wonder why some people show up around here. The simple truth, though, is that when it comes to the preaching of God's word, it can be used to try to scare people into compliant behavior or bribe people into certain options. Like, this really bad will happen if you don't do this, or look at all you'll get if you do this. And so a lot of people misunderstand God based on that. And then there's a growing number of voices in our culture that actually consider God outdated and unneeded. He's, he's just a superstitious approach for ignorant people. Yeah. If, you're, if you're enlightened, if you're, if you're scientifically minded, everything is cause and effect and you can figure life out. And the challenge is, is that science is critically important, but there's some things it doesn't answer. It doesn't answer the questions of meaning. Just the what, not the why. And so God is misunderstood because our culture has become a little disenfranchised with him. And then some, some are just frustrated by the guidelines that God's word gives when it comes to how to live a healthy life. And if you haven't read scripture, it gets into every area of your life. All of it. It leaves nothing out. It goes, it goes right for your attitudes. 
And you know, really? Or your work ethic, or your sex life. Like it's all in there. And so a lot of people just misunderstand God. So I'd like to talk about the story of God. What is God's story? And like any story, it has an introduction. And the introduction is that God created you on purpose and with purpose. You have been created on purpose and with purpose. A lot of people feel like they're an accident in life. Somehow they don't seem to fit into the environment they're in or to the social circles that they're a part of. And so they just feel kind of accidental. Uh, here's a really important thing to know. If your identity is based on your feelings, that's going to be a pretty wild ride. Because our feelings ebb and flow quite a bit. And if they're based on others' comments about you, that's going to be a pretty difficult experience too. Because if, we, if our identity is based on our feelings or on other people's comments, we're going to get dehumanized a lot. God's word seems to be filled with an ongoing reference theme that he intended us. We're not here by accident. That, that you are created by God and in the image of God. And I don't pretend to understand all that that means. But at least it seems to mean that he created you on purpose and with purpose. That God actually intends us to create, not just more people, though that's part of it, but to take good things and make them even better, to, to cultivate a kind of culture that helps people to flourish. That, that's where the word uh, culture actually comes from, is, is cultivation, to, to help something to grow well, to use our words to help build up and bring order to things, that, that we're, we're to have healthy relationships with God and with others. There's a purpose to life. And it matters. So the introduction is that you were created, God created you on purpose and with purpose. But like every story, there's also conflict. And the conflict is, is that, that uh, you simply, can, God cannot ignore sin. God cannot ignore sin. And this frustrates a lot of people, even using the word sin. It really should be spelt with four letters. Because there are people that are highly offended. It seems so judgmental. And the first thing you should know is scripture just kind of levels the playing field on the sin issue. This is what it says in Romans chapter 3. It says, for all have sinned. That's right. The person beside you has sinned. I know you're sitting there and going, I am well aware that they have sinned. <laughs> but the person inside of you has sinned too. I don't know anyone. I've never met the person who claims that they're perfect. But everyone believes they're better than someone else. Oh, we don't say it that way. We, we make it sound a little more palatable. We say, well, at least I'm not as bad as. It's the same thing. And there seems to be a set of standards that we all under, it's, it's built in. We kind of know these things are out of bounds, like violence. Not acceptable. I don't know anybody who thinks that's a good option. Or betrayal. Not acceptable. Children dying from malnutrition. I don't know anybody who thinks that's a good idea. It's not acceptable. People being sexually assaulted. Not acceptable. Killing others in the name of religion. Not acceptable. Breaking promises of fidelity. Not acceptable. Racial injustice. Not acceptable. Taking what you have not earned or have not been given. Not acceptable. I don't know anyone who thinks that those things are not out of bounds. The question is, why do they keep happening then? And the first thing to realize is that we actually need a deep sense of what is right and what is wrong. Because if we don't have that sense built into us, it's unbelievable what we're capable of. It is very easy to look at other people and just say, I would never do something like that. And in my experience, the people who say, I would never do something like that, actually will. Like, that's how you know. It's a terrifying thought. It's, it's hard to know what does more damage in us. The sins that are done against us by others, because that's a thing. If we started passing the mic around this morning, we wouldn't have time to listen to the damage that's been done in sinful action against people and how devastating it has been to you. 
the way that it has ground you down and fractured you on the inside to the place that every single day life is a struggle. But it's hard to know if that's greater damage than the, than the sin done by us. Because inside of us, when we know we've stepped out of bounds, we carry around a kind of gain, uh, uh, guilt and shame. It's just very difficult to navigate. In fact, it gets so pronounced that this is what happens. When bad and unjust things happen to you, you will actually start thinking, I deserve it. That's the devastating, destructive influence of sin within us. And, and our world doesn't have a lot of good news for if anyone who's weak or poor or old or vulnerable. There's not a lot of options. And what God wants us to know is that he can't ignore it and he won't overlook it. If he did that, it would be unjust because sin does real damage to real people. And that's the question. Why doesn't God just overlook it? Why doesn't he just forget? Why doesn't he just let it go? Isn't there a song? Just let it go. <laughs> it's, it's in a movie. What, what is the movie? Yes, I've never seen that movie. Oh, I'm feeling judgment. I have a 20-month-old granddaughter, and it's actually one of my life goals to get through my entire life and never see that movie. <laughs> it's not looking good. Why does, sin just not, why does God not just overlook sin? Because that would trivialize sin and the damage that it actually does to people. If someone you loved very dearly, they lost their life as a result of wrongful action taken by someone else, criminal action taken by someone else, and that person was brought into the legal system, and the judge just looked at him and said, yeah, I'm just, I, just forget about it. Go on your way. Would you think that was appropriate? When, some, when we see injustice, we know something's wrong and something's broken. And so God can't just overlook it. So how are we to deal with this then? Well, actually, we have a pretty good example of something like this in our culture. So when you are at a place where it feels like you can't really manage the challenges, the pressures, and the complexities of life, we'll often go to someone who's a counselor, and we'll start talking to them. And what's interesting is that a counselor does not ignore the painful and dark parts of our lives. In fact, they actually help us focus on them. If we try to ignore them, it's what makes us uh, unable to manage life, if we're in denial or ignoring those parts of our lives, we just break down, we freeze up, we, we can't move forward. But when the counselor actually encourages you to revisit terrible things done to you and unhealthy things done by you, you start to recover something. You start gaining some kind of perspective. You start finding yourself able to move a little bit forward. We cannot recover by ignoring or denying the impact of sin in our world. So hear this. The reason God cannot ignore sin, the reason he talks about it as much in Scripture as we did, as he does, that you saw it in the passage we read this morning, is not to call attention in order so that he's justified in creating distance from or bringing punishment to. God calls attention to our sin because like a counselor, he wants to bring healing and recovery to us. And that leads us to the third part of God's story, and that's the rescue mission. See, God does in you and for you what you cannot do for yourself. He does in you and for you what you cannot do for yourself. We have a saying around here, grace always accepts you as you are, but it never leaves you as you are. It's a fascinating thing. See, we can't really pay the full price for our sinful actions. We might say we're sorry, and that's acknowledging our sinful actions, but that's not the same thing as, as paying for them. For example, if, if someone stole something from you, and then you found that out and you confronted them, and they said, I'm really sorry, and you said, all right, I, I forgive you. I mean, you still had to absorb the loss if they didn't return it. But if they stole again and you went back to them and said, hey, what's the deal here? And they looked at you and they said, I said I was sorry. And this is what people think about our acknowledgement of our frustration, as though that is the payment. That's not a, the, the payment. That's just an acknowledgement there's a debt. 
When, when we've sinned against ourselves, against others, against God, we, we create this debt. And, and we, that has to be paid. Somebody has to pay that. And God found a way, a very costly way, to pay the debt and to forgive us. He didn't say it doesn't matter. Because God is just. And it does matter. Sins have to be dealt with. The payment has to be made. But in Christ, God pays the penalty for us. And that penalty is a death penalty. That's the highest penalty. In our culture, if you commit certain crimes, you may be fined or incarcerated for a period of time. If they're especially egregious crimes, you might be incarcerated for the rest of your life, however long you will live. But in some states and in some places in the world, there's a penalty even beyond that. And that is, we're not just going to keep you from doing other bad things to other people. We're going to end your life. It's the death penalty. It's the, the highest penalty. And that's the penalty that Christ paid on our behalf because that's the biggest, most expensive penalty. Whatever our sins are, he's more than covered it. He paid the death penalty. The passage we read actually reveals an astonishing insight that we're not just rescued from penalty and punishment, we're reconciled in our relationship to God. We're not just made right with him, we're actually made alive in him. That's really quite a thing. And when that happens, God actually begins to work in us. It helps us to, to do things that we didn't think were possible before, Maybe when someone does something that's, that's hurtful or spiteful to you, the, the natural tendency is just to want to get them back or at least say something about them to somebody else. And then you find yourself willing to have a conversation with them and pursue reconciliation and forgiveness. That's not just living up to a new standard. That's living a new way of life. Or, or maybe you find yourself being generous because the what our culture tells us is consume everything you make and everything you're going to make. And we find ourselves actually not just keeping a rule to let go of something, but wanting to make a difference in the world around us or, or to stop hiding, to actually acknowledge a painful truth about ourselves, to speak truth in love, not for the purpose of creating shame, but for the purpose of being seen. This is what grace looks like incarnate. The church's inability to acknowledge our own faults and failures has kept Christ invisible in our world. We have stories to tell. And when we tell them, grace becomes visible. It leads us to the last point. This is kind of the purpose, the, the epilogue of, of God's story, and that is the only thing that motivates him is love. It would have been easier for God to erase the human experiment unless he actually loves people, which he does. God couldn't bear the thought of you being separated from him. He couldn't bear the thought of you taking an eternity to try to pay down your own debt, but there was something he could bear, and that was a cross. And that's what he does for us tells us in John 3.16, the most quoted verse in all of Scripture, for God so loved, yes, you want to know what drives the actions of God. God so loved the world, every single person in it, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Most people don't know this story about God. They have imagined or heard something very, very different. If you want to understand the heart of God, look at the cross. If you want to understand the seriousness of sin, look at the cross. If you want to answer the question, how much does God love me? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. Let's bow our heads this morning.
I don't know what your thoughts have been about God up to this point in your life. And I don't know what information you've accessed or maybe even rejected. But I'd like you to freshly think about the story of God. So, a couple of questions to consider. You can just think about this while you're, you're sitting. Do you have a sense of purpose in your life? Not just to make money to have better things or bigger things or newer things, or just to be able to keep things. Because that, that will wear you down over time. As it turns out, it's not enough. We were made for more. Have you, have you wrestled with the seriousness of the sins done against you? Or do you just walk around telling yourself and everybody else it's not a big deal? Or the sins done by you? There is someone who has done something for you that we can't do for ourselves. We don't have the resource. We can't pay the debt because we don't have the resource. It's, if we had it, we would. It's just we don't. But someone paid it for us. And the question is, what are you going to do about that? So I'd actually like to offer an opportunity for you to respond, if you want to. There's no pressure. This is a conversation. If, if you're not ready to make a decision today, that, that's entirely up to you. But if you've heard enough today that you'd like to consider another step, maybe this stays for you. Maybe it's why you're here. Maybe, maybe it's part of God's purpose. Maybe today was not an accident. And maybe what you do now really matters. So I'm going to start by looking over here at this section by the windows. And if you'd like to make a decision today to accept what Christ has done for you and to be open to what he'll do in you, all I'm going to ask you to do is just to look right at me. If, if this isn't applying to you today, just Kind of keep your head down, don't look at me. But I'm going to start over in the section by the windows. And if you want to make that decision today, just look right at me. That's, that's all you have to do. And I'm just going to acknowledge you. So anyone on this section over here, just keep looking right at me. Thank you. Thank you. I see that person. Just keep looking right at me. Thank you. I see that person. Thank you. I see that person. Thank you. Just keep looking so I don't miss you. Thank you. Right. I'm in the center section right in front of me now, so if, you, if that applies to you, just look right at me. Thank you. Just anyone else? Thank you. Just keep looking until I... Thank you. Thank you very much. Next section over. Just look right at me if this applies to you today. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just keep looking right at me. Last section against the wall. If this applies to you today, just look right at me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Heavenly Father, there have been things done to us that we seem unable to recover from. And there have been things done by us that honestly, even when it even when we find a reason. We still feel bad. There seems to be a problem with our ability to move forward. Would you help us from what we've heard of your story today to recognize we are not an accident, that you have a purpose for our life, and you are committed to that purpose regardless of what has come up to this moment. 
end, you have done for us what we are unable to do for ourselves. And you will do something in us that we can't just work up in ourselves. Would you help us fully receive that today by your grace and in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Would you all stand with me this morning?